Good day, and welcome to the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, the use of light intervention to reduce fatigue and depression for those in cancer treatment or survivorship conference. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Ms. Jennifer Gillette. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you so much for uh, introducing us, Christina. Yes, I am the staff social worker at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. I'd like to welcome everyone on the call today, and thank you for joining our Lunch and Learn with Link. Uh, this month's speakers will discuss the use of light intervention to reduce fatigue and depression in individuals undergoing cancer treatment or in survivorship. It is our goal that today's program will inspire you and equip you with a new skill or idea as you learn how to go through this journey. A special thank you to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and our link partners for making this program possible today. Our outline will go as follows. First, I'm just going to take a couple minutes to tell you about the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, and then we will introduce Dr. William H. Redd, and he'll speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then Dr. Kate Duhamel for another 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will open the floor for questions. Uh, we will then wrap up the hour with uh, some resources and thank you. For those of you who may not be familiar with the link, our mission is dedicated to helping individuals and their families from diagnosis through survivorship. We reinforce and complement medical care by providing resources, support, and education. Some of the resources we provide to help families navigate their transplant journey are our chronic graft versus host disease telephone series and webinar support. We have a caregiver webinar series, our peer support mentor program for patients, caregivers, and donors, our second birthdays recognition program, and we also have a variety of books and provide referrals and emotional support from a licensed social worker. If there is anything we can do to support you, please feel free to reach out to us after this call today. Now, just a couple housekeeping items to maximize the experience of all on the call today. Due to a limited amount of time, the facilitator will need to make sure each question or comment does not go longer than necessary. Please also only ask one question at a time. You can always get back in line if there is time on the call to ask another one. Please also refrain from any judgmental statements towards your fellow participants, respecting that everyone handles this experience in their own unique way. And please know the information provided in this program is meant to stimulate conversation with your own health care provider and is not meant to replace your individualized medical plan. So now on to the educational part of our program. We are so excited and honored to introduce you to our first speaker today, Dr. William Redd. Dr. Redd received his PhD in developmental psychology from the University of North Carolina. He currently is the professor and co-director for the Cancer Prevention and Control Program, Department of Oncology Sciences, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Dr. Redd has been engaged in research on psychosocial oncology and cancer prevention and control for more than 35 years and is credited for introducing behavioral psychology and behavioral medicine to research and clinical practice in cancer supportive care. His most recent research on controlling cancer-related fatigue has drawn considerable attention, including invitations to prevent or present at international meetings such as the Biotechnology World Congress, the World Congress of Psychooncology and Psychosocial Academy, and the International Conference of Behavioral Medicine, along with two articles in the Wall Street Journal. For 40 years, he has had NIH research support and has been the recipient of five research scientist awards. His current research examines the contribution of circadian rhythm disruption in cancer-related somatic and behavioral problems and the role of systematic light exposure and programmed environmental illumination to improve negative effects of cancer and its treatment. His mission is to apply behavioral principles to understand and treat negative complications of cancer and its treatments. So please join me in thanking Dr. Redd for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Redd. Nice to be here. Um, it's difficult to lecture or to talk.
talk to a group where you can't see their faces. So um, I'll do my best. I've done this a few times. Each time it gets more natural. And also, I don't speak loudly enough. Please chime in and tell me to speak louder or interrupt me. Do not sit there and be polite because I want to be sure you, you can hear this. It's really a, a great pleasure that Kate and I are able to <clears throat> present to you. Kate and I have been learning together since Kate was in junior high school 25 years ago. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, that's kind of, Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I started in the field when I was 10, so 40 years ago. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> This work is really exciting to me, and it, it makes the point that our whole bodies are tuned in with the moon and the stars. So every muscle, every organ, every cell in our body has a circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythms are rhythms that are around the 24-hour cycle. And so I'll explain this more, but that is the gist of this. So let me begin with discussing how I got into this kind of work. Cancer-related fatigue is a mystifying problem, and it's been a problem for a long time. Cancer-related fatigue is the most commonly reported problem. Indeed, um, between 23 and 44% of all cancer survivors report significant fatigue up to five years post-treatment. So it, it starts, and we don't really understand why it doesn't correct itself. People recover, but it takes can take years, and it's uh, it's so this disruption is seen. And cancer fatigue, which is the first thing we begin studying, is the one of the most glaring examples of circadian disruption. Um, so, what is cancer-related fatigue? It is a distressing, persistent sense of physical, emotional, and/or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion related to cancer or, or cancer treatment that is not proportional to research to recent activity. So patients can take a nap and they wake up and they still free take. It's not tiredness like you'd be exhausted from doing annual labor. It's more, um, it's deeper than that in a sense. Um, patients report feeling tired even after resting, have reduced capacity to carry out normal activities, limit social activities because they are too tired, or diminished concentration of, and cognitive deficits. So it's a pervasive problem. We have um, been looking at this with fatigue. Also, it affects depression and sleep problems. So those are the three things we've been looking at in our work. I'll talk about our future work, and we're looking at other aspects of cancer, such as metabolic syndrome and obese frailty. Some of these related to survivor and occurrence. So... What are, bio, what are circadian rhythms? They are normal biological functions that follow a 24-hour cycle and trained by sunlight. That is, that you temperature, activity, hormonal secretion change across a 24-hour cycle. Natural light, morning light, gets the system going. So um, we see that we have more activity in the mornings than in the evenings. So this is consistent with the notion that we are all tied to, have a, to the moon and the stars and the solar system. It's, um, this uh, disruption has related to fatigue, cognitive impair impairment, sleep disruption, and depression. So I got into this because I didn't fatigue and I just didn't really understand how this sleep. So I've been talking and... Sonia and Cole Israel, who's a very eminent light researcher, said, why don't you look at circadian disruption? So that was really her suggestion. That's what embarked our, our research. We've been doing this. Our first publication was 2014, and we now have three large NIH grants and um, funding, and we've published in this area. So it's, it's a, a very exciting development. So so what? A, you can't see this, but we have various lighting devices. These are devices that can train or stimulate the circadian system. We have one which is a small held hand, looks like a cell phone that delivers light. We have other devices. But we've found as we've gone through, we've gone through about five or six different um, devices because each of them have their unique strengths and weaknesses. 
We now have a device, glasses or goggles, that the patient or the individual, I, I hate to use the word patient, because anyway, the individual, the person with cancer, fighting cancer, or a survivor of cancer, has um, uses this cell phone-like apparatus to get the stimulation that you need to entrain the system, to evoke the system. By, entrain means to elicit or evoke. The recommended dose is up to 30, at least 30 minutes a day um, in the morning. It has to be in the morning because it gets the system going. One of the problems that people have with using cell phones and <clears throat> pads or information pads, electronic pads at night is that they, I mean, it's going to drink the water. They um, stimulate the system so when somebody should be going to sleep, the lights that they use on their, their tablet um, gets them get the circadian system going, which is not what you want. So these are lights that present in the morning. We, how do we know 30 minutes? We don't really know. We find that 30 minutes is sufficient. We haven't had the time to do a dose-response study, but we have some studies where they're in hospital rooms that they get the light as much as four hours a day. Those studies are done because their patients are in bed. These are when we do, we have a study where we look at environmental lighting. We illuminate the whole patient room with lamps, flood lamps that make it very pleasant. But they may be sleeping, they may have to go to the bathroom, to, so it's interrupted. But we find that we want to make it long so they get at least 30 minutes of elapsed time. They get more than that most likely. But 30 minutes seems to be. So we have we have a light device, which is a handheld. That is problematic because the, the light can be intense and aversive so the patient can easily turn the angle. Well, that's fine, except if you turn the angle too much, you don't get the proper light dose. So this is a very technical, precise system. So we've gone to an apparatus which is a pair of goggles. We call them light glasses. They're made by there are two manufacturers. One is... Um, is IOAYO, which is made in Bulgaria. You can buy them commercially. Um, there are other apparatuses. There's light books that are um, big things you can buy on Amazon. So there are a lot of ways that uh, you can get the light. And there's no one best way. We use the light book, that we, the, the, excuse me, we use the lenses, the AYOs, because number one, they're easy. The person can put them on their face, on their like a pair of glasses. They're made so they can go up and project light into the eye above the, through the glasses. Now let me, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. Let me explain what we think we're doing. The circadian rhythms are 24-hour cycles of activity going around a 24-hour clock. I apologize for interrupting you, but please bear with me. So, um, the circadian rhythms are these rhythms, and they're, start in the morning by natural sunlight. Um, the light comes into the eye, and light images come into the eye and go to the occipital um, cortex, which is the back of the brain, but they also go to the hypothalamus, and that is the clock, the internal clock, which regulates systems. So the light comes into the eye and goes to the, where you see an image, but it also goes to the occipital lobe, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is what it's called, <clears throat> that that um, keeps entrains the system, keeps it regular. So people can have blindness where they most blindness we're familiar with is blindness of the visual cortex, but they can still have circadian rhythms. Now, a patient who has total blindness has both the the visual and the uh, synchronized or the hypothalamic connection is really in bad shape because they have sleep disruption and it's very hard to treat these people. Forcing that is a real, relatively rare condition. Anyway, so, so they come into the eye, the light comes in the eye, and it stimulates the circadian system. The circadian system then puts signals out to the organs to do activity, hormonal changes, body temperature, many body functions. So these lights, the light books that we use the light sources, the lenses, the light book, or the total illumination of the patient's room are all different ways of delivering what we call circadian effective light. 
That is why it is effective in stimulating or energizing the circadian system. So <clears throat> that, that is what we're trying to do with these lights. So we have light in the morning, which gets the system going, and I'll talk about our results of our research. But also is important is we have lights that dim down the system in the evening, get melatonin going. So some people recommend wearing the orange goggles if they have a circadian disruptive problem because the orange blocks out the bluish light that is stimulating. So it's important to get bright light in the morning and dim light in the evening to keep the system going. If you mix these up, you'll get people sleeping in the day and um, energized at night, which is, of course, not what you want. So we have a light book, which is, is and that's available online. I think they're about $200. Goggles are available also online. It's called AYO. There's also another one that is called um, Rock in the name of the other one. We recommend that uh, when we have no financial interest. We like the IO, the AYO, because it's reliable. And for our research purposes, it's, the patient turns on. It's very comfortable. It's lightweight. We know the patient is getting the light to the eye where the light book, the... the um, Cell phone size light source is can't be sure of that. Now there are other light sources. One's called Happy Light. There are a variety of light sources that you can buy commercially. They're less expensive. They are fine because they're soft and they pro project sufficient light. But we've gone with the IO because it also lets us to to monitor use. So we want to be sure that the patients are getting at least 30 minutes a day a week. So the, the, the light, the glasses, broadcast to us compliance data so we know if patients have been adherent to the program, program or not. Because it's important to know that because if we have a patient who didn't receive any benefit, we'd say, well, what is their adherence? What are, have they um, used the light? And often we find they haven't. So this lets us be more precise scientifically. So the lights we have are very comfortable, you press a button, they come on for 30 minutes here pre-time. And um, the other source we have is freestanding light pole lamps. These are very expensive because they had to be weighted so the patient couldn't tip them over. But in our new research, we're using sconces in the patient's room. These are lights that project the same wavelength, the same kind of light you're getting with the the IO or the um, Luminette, the other one is called Luminette, the Luminette, um, but it showers the whole room. So patients and nurses family love to be in the room. It, it feels good, quote unquote. It feels like a lovely, bright, sunny morning without being very like sun and it's very pleasant. So the nurses like it and like to be in the room. So let's talk about our first study. The first study that we published in 14 light use with cancer survivors. We had survivors of leukemia, ovarian cancer, GYN cancer, it's called ovarian stem cell uh, leukemia, um, transplants, um, breast, a variety of, that all had to get in the study. They had to have significant cancer related fatigue. There's a published measure of this which we use in our research. So they all had verified, certified problems with fatigue and sleep. So we um, gave them this light to use the light every morning for 30 minutes for 14 days. Then we measured along and then we went another 14 days. So we followed them for, for four weeks in which we got daily ratings. We got so much to our total shock. And I, must, I remember the day like it was yesterday when our boss said he said, he got incredibly strong results. I said, what? So I guess we were trying this out, but the results were whopping. We had big, they call effect sizes. So I'm looking at the, you can't see this, but if you look at our paper, which is um, 2014, you see these figures. But we had the, the fatigue, all people in the study had clinically significant fatigue on a published scale. They um, entered the study. They were randomly assigned, that is, by flip of a coin, they received brighter dim light. They didn't know 
which they didn't know the name or the condition they were in. So they didn't know, oh, I'm in the bright, oh, I'm in the dim. And they couldn't tell. No one was able to guess. So the bright is a bright blue, and the other one is a dim. We've now gone on to have bright white and dim white. We have to other dim lights, but there's problems with that. So in our research, we have dim white and bright white light. We, saw, we started the study where people have turned out in the bright light condition, the active condition, had more fatigue than people in the other one. But within two weeks, there was a significant difference, which increased to four weeks was even bigger, and even seven weeks, even at seven weeks, at three weeks post-treatment, we still saw gigantic differences. You know, like 18 versus eight, like twice, as, twice the difference. So then we had um, also looked at um, fatigue levels in these two conditions. So the depression was significantly different. The fatigue was equally strong, and in fact even stronger than the results for depression. So um, we have replicated this. We've done this in hospital rooms with patients. So, in conclusion, we could say from this initial research, the light is effect, highly effective, it's inexpensive, easy to deliver, no side effects, and it's considerable application potential. So, we've got big effects there. Now, what are we doing now? And uh, I take too much more time than hogging up case time, so I'll, I'll wrap this up. We have studies now that we're looking at, and these are randomized trials funded by the National Cancer Institute. We are looking at light and hospital rooms, as we said, look at all these outcomes. But by looking at the work in the hospital, we're able to take, take, take bloods and urine and samples because they are routinely gathered for medical purposes. So we have access to all these biological measures, samples. So we could never do this without being plugged into an ongoing medical regimen. Very lucky to have this transplant situation because you can know what they got, how much they got. And so our future work is looking at light to control metabolic syndrome in women receiving adjuvant chemotherapy. A big problem with that group is they gain weight and um, because of the circadian disruption. So the light is designed to help them. Okay. We also have studies going with men who are on adrenaline deprivation therapy for advanced stage prostate cancer. They develop a condition called the obese frailty. They get heavy because of the circadian disruption, in the, um, and but they're they're weak. So the two together, horrible situation. We have research there. We also have research in the hospital room survivors and with women on adjuvant treatment. So we have a group of studies going. The work is done at Mount Sinai and Memorial Sloan Kettering. We have a partnership that came out of Forge for many years. We also have studies going at the City of Hope, which is outside of um, LA and, and Duarte, which is close to Pasadena, they're in that part of the country. Um, and they're doing studies with us. So we have big research program, and we are also willing the light to affect other conditions. So we have the same pattern of disruptions you're seeing in people with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. So all these patients are plus potential beneficiaries of light intervention. And it's a small team, so we have researchers, though, in, in Iceland, in Iowa, in New York, in Europe, so it's a very interesting group. We have a light meeting every couple of years in in Reykjavik, which is a great city to study light. So I think that we have an intervention, as I said before, easy to deliver, inexpensive, and effective. It's really exciting to be able to do do this at the end of my career, and I'm going to plan on retiring after 80. So I'm still at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Rudd. That is fascinating and such a great help to so many people. 
We appreciate you taking the time to share your research with us today. I would now like to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Kate Duhamel. Uh, she has a PhD in health psychology and received it from Yeshiva University in Bronx, New York. She is the attending psychologist and director of the Psycho-Oncology Education and Training Institute at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, she, as a health psychologist, I, ah, sorry, can't talk. As a health psychologist, she helps patients cope with chronic illness and stressful life events through the use of cognitive behavioral therapy, including strategies such as hypnosis, to reduce their anxiety and depression and improve their quality of life. Dr. DeHamel has been intensely involved in a multitude of research projects pertaining to psychological health and access to care. She's been published frequently in academic journals, especially in her research interests, including increasing the quality of life, sexual health, and investigating the barriers and supports that affect colorectal screening participation among minority populations. We are honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Kate. Thanks for asking me. I um, I just want to say uh, Bill and I have been working together since 1995, I think, and um, we first started collaborating when he was a professor at Sloan Kettering and I was a postdoc fellow here, and we both had an interest in behavioral interventions, which we can talk about more in a minute if you'd like, but part of our interest is in cognitive behavior therapy. And uh, one of the first things we did together was design a cognitive behavior therapy for people who were survivors of hemopoietic stem cell transplant um, and who had uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression and distress. So my and PTSD, my background before meeting Bill was in uh, interventions to treat PTSD. So we combined our inner interests. And we've been doing this work for a long time. The talk that Bill just gave and the one I'm going to give, and I just want to give a shout-out to Benjamin Brewer, who actually gives this talk at our workshop. I give other talks on cognitive behavior therapy. Um, but we, we our research has developed so much so that we now have funding to provide our evidence-based interventions training to clinicians who see cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers. And so the talks that we're giving today are part of what's called an R25E training grant supported by the National Cancer Institute. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I also wanted to let you know there are guidelines on how to re treat cancer-related fatigue by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And these guidelines have recently included the light therapy based on Bill and our research team's work. And this is new to the guidelines. So when I was first asked to participate in this, I immediately thought of including Bill because his breakthrough work is actually now making it into guidelines, practice guidelines in oncology. So it's very exciting to be working with Bill. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of other interventions that are recommended for cancer-related fatigue that are um, non-pharmacological non interventions, cognitive behavior therapy, and then I'll also briefly talk about acupuncture. So my background is in cognitive behavior therapy, but there's a specific cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia called CBTI. And this talk, um, Ben lent me his information so I could give this talk, but it's also cognitive behavior therapy has been an interest of mine for a long time. So as Bill was talking about sleep, sleep varies depending on time of day, but it also depends on age. So the older we get, the less sleep we get um, and require. Um, what our research interests have been in, been in insomnia and in cancer, and insomnia is a difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep that leads to a dissatisfaction with sleep quality or quantity. It can result in impairments at work, school, and other environments, and people also get distressed when they're not sleeping well. In the literature and the definitions, it has to be at least three nights per week for at least three months to be diagnosed with insomnia. 
Patients with cancer have more than double the incidence of insomnia, 50 to 60 percent, versus 12 to 25 percent of the normal population. And 82 percent of bone marrow transplant, um, often called hemopoietic stem cell transplant patients, have moderate to severe insomnia during their treatment. So 82 percent is pretty high. This is caused by complex interruptions, circadian disruptions that Bill talked about, inflammation, tumor growth, depression, anxiety, pain, and medication side effects. So what cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia involves is five components. Stimulus control, which is instructions to break the arousal, the person being awake and being in bed. So what you want to do is pair being in bed with sleep or sex and not for playing games on the phone, or using your tablet. We also use sleep restrictions, which is limiting the time in bed to the time that is spent asleep. So you don't have other time in bed when you're doing other things, and your body becomes conditioned to react to the bed for sleep. We also use cognitive therapies, such as uh, talking about common unhelpful beliefs, such as people worrying about not sleeping and how to um, help people cope with those thoughts when they have them and to decrease these unhelpful thoughts because they can disrupt sleep. Um, we also teach people relaxation training and sleep hygiene, things like Bill mentioned, like not having a bright white light in your room while you're trying to sleep or having your bedroom kind of be like a cave, cool and dark. And we just teach these habits that have been known to help what's called sleep hygiene. Um, by themselves, though, sleep hygiene, that education is not as beneficial as including that in a program like ours, Cognitive Behavior Therapy. So um, just in the interest of time, because I want to make sure we have time for questions, I'm going to skip over some of the theoretical background about the treatment of insomnia, but I wanted to say that every time that we do an intervention, whether it's cognitive behavior therapy or any other kind of intervention, we assess where the person's at. So in this case, you would say a description of the problem. So you, you might have a participant saying, I only sleep four hours a night. Then we try and figure out their average sleep time. So in a 24-hour period, what's the average amount of sleep they're getting? The time in bed, all time in bed, whether asleep or not, whether they wake up in the middle of the night, if they have bed partners, pets, children, um, any environment that may disrupt their sleep. And we ask them to keep track of a sleep journal, and we calculate something called sleep efficiency. I should say we also rule out uh, medical um, issues that could be causing sleep problems um, before we would start this a cognitive behavior therapy intervention. So we might send somebody for a sleep, to a sleep lab for a sleep test or, or something ahead of time. And we work with the, I'm a psychologist, so I'm working with their physician. So we use assessment to see how much time there is asleep and how much time they're in bed. And we try to make that um, a higher number. So say a patient is spending eight hours in bed and is sleeping six hours, their sleep, what we call sleep efficiency would be 75% or six over eight. And so we take all those assessments into account when we start with these interventions with people. And we have target goals that we work out with the person that we're teaching this to. Why do we do stimulus control? Because we want to break the pairing of the bed with being awake. We want to strengthen the pairing of the bed with sleep. And we want to improve their sleep efficiency or the amount of time they're sleeping when they're in bed. So we tell them bed for sleep and sex, okay. Don't nap or sleep anywhere else if possible. And if you are going to nap, you work with the person each person is different, but if 
they need to nap, you, suggest, you might suggest they nap earlier in the day. We ask them to get out of bed if they're not asleep, and we talk about what their sleep environment is like. So I'm going to skip some of my thoughts. So the education that people often give to people who are having problems with sleep is important, but it's not sufficient. So it's called sleep hygiene. Things like don't go to bed on a full stomach or when you're hungry. Make sure your room is dark. The room should be quiet. Exercise. When do you exercise? Is your bed partner snoring? Is the room cool? Are pets and children disrupting your sleep? We talk about use of alcohol and caffeine. And we also talk about a wind down period, about 30 to 60 minutes before going to bed. We talk about relaxation. We have many different ways that we can train people in relaxation. And I know Bill could speak about this for a whole session himself, as could I and others. So there are many people who know the benefits of training people in relaxation. The cognitive approaches, like the talking about unhelpful thoughts, we try to challenge the ones that are not realistic, or we try to reframe things in a more realistic tone. We're not asking people to be Pollyanna and say that nothing is wrong, but we're looking at the belief kind of like a, in a Socratic method where we're looking at what's the evidence for this and what's the evidence against. So a typical course of CBTI in an oncology clinic would be five, about five sessions long. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of a study um, which compared cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia with acupuncture. Um, and this is a big team of people that are just really wonderful to work with. And it's been published recently. It's called Acupuncture Versus Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia and Cancer Survivors, a Randomized Clinical Trial. So what we did in that study was we randomly assigned, like Bill, Bill said, with a flip of a coin, um, patients or participants to receive acupuncture or cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. And we had, um, this was conducted at multiple sites um, and they were uh, about 60% women, 71% were white, 27% black, and three were identified themselves as other uh, races. And the most common cancer type was breast, followed by prostate and hematologic, hematological cancer. So we did the study. It was recently published. and. Participants who were randomly assigned to cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia reported greater improvements in insomnia than those assigned to acupuncture. But both treatments um, reduced uh, insomnia as measured on a standard measure of insomnia index severity score. The cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia um, had greater improvements, but both of those interventions worked. So this was a study comparing two interventions, acupuncture and cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. And so I just wanted to provide a little bit of background for some of the interventions that are also recommended that are non-pharmacological by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So thank you. I hope we have time for questions. We definitely do have time for questions, and thank you so much, Dr. Tate. It's nice to know there's some options here. So, Christina, could you please um, tell everyone how they can ask questions today? Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. And we'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions. And we'll take our first question. Please go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Red, um, I'm curious about the uh, light therapy. Could you go into the effectiveness of the um, freestanding light bulb for flooding the room? 
well, versus you now the goggles? <clears throat> um, we haven't compared them directly. If the two are just mainly what's easier to work with. The patient in the hospital is seriously ill. They're bone marrow transplant, stem cell transplant patients. They're very weak. They wouldn't be able to focus in on the light. So it's, it's really a practical consideration of their condition. Um, I think they're both equally effective because I think what we're talking about is circadian effective light going to the retina. And how we do that, it, it, it doesn't matter. And um, it's matter more, does it go and does it stimulate? So I would say... Doctor. Go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry, Doctor. Because uh, does your work also take into account what was done uh, about two decades ago? Um, at, it started at um, uh, Carnegie Mellon Univers uh, University about their concept of the office and the home of the future test bed in which in an office they start to uh, change uh, the light and tracking that over the course of a full work day. And now, of course, I was recently at the light fair show in Pennsylvania, the trade show, in which several vendors are showing, uh, which they brand as circadian, um, you know, light systems. And I'm wondering if this is similar to that or medically on a very different um, uh, level. Exact same um, mechanism. Uh, my collaborator, Mariana Figueroa, she has a TED talk. F I G U E I R O, Mariana Figueroa. She's a professor at the Lighting okay. RPI, and she has a TED Talk, which you should really watch. It's online. F I G U E R I O. And so she's a lighting researcher, and she's done work beyond ours in illuminating the home environment. So they have studies in Denmark which they're their effects of the whole lighting. So, yes, this is part of the same movement, you might say. Ours is used for, ours is medical and ours is used primarily for cancer. But it's also... I just... Go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted... This would just reminded me that um, Bill and I have absolutely no financial conflicts to disclose. So we, we are not involved in any of the... Um, machines or mechanisms or the way that the light is delivered. Yes, yes, of course. No, I, I, I thank you for this. And, and, and Doctor, while, while you're here, you said something, I, I mean, uh, Dr. Red, you said something about uh, metabolic changes that you're finding with circadian, because I know after I had follicular lymphoma and I had uh, R-CHOP chemotherapy, I was told that the chemotherapy just blew up my um, system and needed my immune, my um, metabolism had to be reset because yes. there was a sudden sudden weight gain, and that's, of course I even mm -hmm. that's very common, and that's because there's a disruption in the the rhythms affecting weight metabolism metabolism. Are, are you saying then, doctor, that the light therapy can help in that regard as well? Well, our initial evidence suggests yes, but that's a whole other area that we've just begun. So oh, thank you, Doctor. Mm. But we don't have a definitive answers. Okay, thank you. Just because I did consult with Dr. Um, um, uh, uh, Colin Campbell, and he said that a lot of this they're showing on resetting metabolism through fasting, supervised fasting. I don't know about that. Okay. Way to do Thank that. you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we have our next question, please? Yes, and just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press star 1. Again, that's star 1 to ask a question, and we'll take our next question. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, my name is Norman Lieberman, and uh, I recently completed um, chemotherapy, and I found this um, presentation today very informative on this uh, on the uh, sleep uh, patterns but I also thought that this presentation was going to cover poor memory which I'm struggling with since the chemo treatment uh, I can't I have a lot of formal education and yet I still can't 
remember or grab bits and bytes of information that I normally could have prior to the chemo. And my doctor said that's common and that can last for X number of months, depending on the person. But I was hoping that you guys can um, share something in that regard, regarding the, the memory. When can that... When and how can I expect it to come back? Are there tricks of the trade that would expedite the, my memory coming back? Um, and anyways, that that was the gist of my question. Um, I One of my colleagues who is now just went from us to Northwest is now a, a professor in Denmark at I've forgotten the university. Anyway, she did a study, and she looked at light for cognitive uh, deficits. She found improvement, not as, dramatic, not as dramatic as we saw with the light for fatigue, depression, and sleep, but a positive benefit. And that's something that I haven't pursued because recognize that you only have so many people, so many hours in the day, and so much funding. So that's an area that's ripe for investigation. The circadian rhythm entrainment is believed or is thought or suggests that it does improve cognitive acuity. But I, I, can't, just, I, I can't recommend that because that's not my area. I also want to suggest maybe the um, coordinators or of this program might want to do um, one of these on what's called neuropsychology. And here at Sloan, we have uh, my colleague, Tim Ollis, who's the head of that lab. And he actually w is one of the leading experts in the world on cognitive changes and interventions for, for cognitive issues. So his last name is A-L-H-E-S, Tim Ollis, or um, he's a Ph.D. and he's head of the neuropsych lab here at Sloan Kettering. If they Googled him, they would get find his email address, would they not, Kate? Yeah, and they'd find he's, he's really one of the major people who um, is doing research in this area. Thank you. That's great. great. We will make note of that. Thank you. Okay, can we have our next question, please? It appears there are no further questions at this time. Okay, well, you know, just out of curiosity, uh, do, can you mention any of the hospitals or places people can look into these interventions other than uh, getting their devices, Kate, Dr. Kate? Yes, so um, for cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, you can go to Psychology Today website and search for providers who have a specialty in cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia or sleep problems, which is often referred to as CBTI. And then more and more cancer centers, including our own, are doing research and offer acupuncture. But my background is in cognitive behavior therapy, so I don't have a direct referral for that. Okay, thank you. And also, regarding the napping, I know you started to touch on that. Um, I know some people say it's helpful, some people say it's not. Um, can you elaborate just a little bit on the role napping plays when someone's dealing with fatigue? Well, I mean, Bill will talk about this too, I hope. Um, but when you're doing cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, you don't – you recommend that people not take naps um, in the afternoon because you don't want to disrupt their circadian rhythms or their sleep-wake cycle. So you want their sleep drive to be high when they're going to bed. Um, so if somebody is napping, I mean, of course, everybody is different and it depends on whether they're currently undergoing treatment or not, then we would suggest that they nap earlier in the day and not later. But, Bill, do you want to also address napping? Well, I, would agree. I would agree with everything you say, Kate. I think napping is sort of a double-edged sword, and napping doesn't really help fatigue. Fatigue is not tiredness from not enough rest. It's a biological process concerning circadian rhythms. It's quite different from... So when I first thought about fatigue... 
do things like, oh, let's do power naps. That is not effective. And I also um, wondered how you could say it's not something that's defined by it's not benefiting from rest, which is one of the ways we define fatigue. But that's because I really didn't have any idea of what was going on with cancer-related fatigue and the role of disruptive rhythm. When you see, look at it that way and take it away from looking at it, tiredness, exhaustion, but rather look at it as fatigue and absence of stressful activities, you get not getting your handle better on the phenomenon. So I think it's confused with with lack of rest, and it is not that. Okay, and Dr. Red, one more question for you. Um, in the research that you've done, I know that some people sometimes have light sensitivity. Has there been any side effects you've noticed in any of the patients? I, could, I didn't plan it, but that's a good question. No, the light is UV protected, so there's no issue with... We haven't noted any side effects. We have a whole list of things that... They say, oh, I got a rash. Well, we, every time we get a complaint like that, we go to the literature, we go to experts in ophthalmology, and there's no evidence that this light causes rash. So we've not identified any. Now, if someone is hypomanic or manic depressive, and Kate can correct that, the light can induce mania, but that's rare. So if somebody's got a history of, of, mani of mania, then we recommend they do not use light therapy. Am I right, Kate? Yes, you're right, Bill. And there's some other exclusions in our research, but again, Bill and I have no financial interest in these, and I think on all these products, they probably list the things that you should not be using. Uh, you shouldn't be using the light if you have um, different conditions, but I don't have the whole list in front of me currently but I know that they do put those warnings on products. Okay. That is great. Well, thank you both. Again, such a great honor to have you with us today. And I want to thank everyone jo joining us today. If you'd like further information about survivorship issues or supports available, please feel free to contact us at the link at 1-800-LINK-LINK. BMT. Uh, just so you know, you will be receiving a survey today. Uh, we certainly like to know whatever we can do to improve your experience, or if you have ideas for future programs, like we're definitely taking note of the cognitive changes uh, and the speaker suggested, so thank you for that. Um, just so everyone knows, next month our Lunch and Learn will be on the quality of life for um, patients dealing with chronic graft-versus-host disease. And as a reminder, we have a wonderful peer mentor program. If someone is interested in talking with someone else who has completed transplant and is doing well as a survivor, uh, as well as caregivers or donors, we are happy to connect you with those people. So thank you again to Dr. Red, Dr. Duhamel, our sponsors, our link partners, and everyone for joining us. Have a great day.